uh, participants are joining in uh, Zoom and YouTube. YouTube live stream is also uh, enabled now. So over to uh, Ebenezer, who is going to be the host for today's session, inaugural session. Um, uh, Ebenezer, you can start with your uh, with the program. Yes. Thank you, Elan Serenana. Good morning, everyone. To quote by Petran Russell, mathematics, when rightly viewed, possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. I'm Ebenezer, and I'm indeed glad to take the host of today's inaugural session of Curry Leaf Days 2022. I'll walk you through the agenda of today's sessions. The meeting as rightly started at 10.30, starts with the history of curry leaf. And after that, we have the inaugural of Curry Leaf Days 2022. And one of our friends will be walking through the curry leaf events of 2021 to 22. And we have feedbacks of the previous curry leaf events. And at last, we have a note from the faculty advisor and the meeting ends by 11.30. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Kiran Kumar Behra, Postdoctoral Fellow of IAC Bengaluru, to give a short note on history of curry leaf. Sir. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. And I welcome you all to the curry leaf days. And I'm really honored to present to you all the history of uh, curry leaf. So the story started in the year 2020, uh, when because of the pandemic, uh, MTTS was forced to have it conduct its uh, summer camp online. So uh, during the camp, a group of participants in level one who had never met before, so they became close friends and they thought that, okay, MTTS and uh, um, learning mathematics is fine, but let us do something extra. So they came up with the idea of uh, conducting an interview of Professor uh, Kumarasan himself, the video of which is available in YouTube. Uh, so during the course of the interview, they plan to uh, create a platform, a virtual platform in which the MTTS alumni can stay connected. So the idea was uh, proposed to Professor Kumarasan in uh, September 2020. Later in the year, November uh, 2020, uh, the MTTS Trust kindly uh, was happy with our idea. And it, uh, the Trust kindly agreed to uh, support uh, Curry Leaf in uh, initial days. So uh, an advisory committee was also formed. It uh, consisted of Professor A.J. Jayantan, former, former faculty at Goa University, and Professor Satyanarayan Reddy, currently a faculty at Srinagar University. Uh, so uh, the advisory committee had helped us and guided us through all the events uh, for the past two years, and I hope uh, they will continue to do so. So uh, gradually, other uh, MTTS alumni got connected and uh, uh, the meeting was held in April 2021, last year. So in that meeting, uh, Curry Leaf is a club of uh, former uh, MTTS uh, participants was formed. And we had specific rules and uh, like uh, uh, goals in our uh, with in mind. So what we do, what we how we should do conduct uh, all events. So it was laid down and uh, yeah, so the club was formed. So uh, let me uh, uh, also tell you who are we. So we are a bunch of uh, form, uh, MTTS alumni uh, students who had attended uh, MTTS at some point of our career. So we are all uh, MSc students, research scholars, postdoc fellows and young faculty members affiliated to various institutes in India. So our primary goal as a club is to conduct various events, stay connected, and also get connected to the larger uh, student uh, community in India. So with that, uh, enough of this introduction. 
so i will let you all uh, enjoy the actual movie but before i sign off uh, in true mtts style i ask you to think why we named ourselves karile okay thank you thank you so much sir for for an pondering uh, thought on why it's named as karile and we we'll should sure think about it Yeah. Indeed, the work of our alumnus has made everyone us, every one of us, to be united, and I guess it's one of the plus points of the pandemic. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us uh, with the history of Karili. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite um, Dr. Santana from Department of Mathematics and Statistics from IIT Kanpur to deliver the inaugural address of Karili Days. Please, sir. uh thank you abhinav sir good morning to all i think uh, as kiran said i kiran has already told you about the history of curry leaf i did say the professor kumareshan uh, from the beginning had been thinking about having an alumni of mtts uh, participants and uh, somehow did not work out i think one of the good thing that happened and pandemic was that the online platform that is available to us and with through which the curry leaf started and curry leaf is going to be a catalyst for the students i think professor Kira, dr karan kumar bera said think about the name curry leaf okay. so that's a hint i given so anyway, i have been very uh, glad to be part of this inauguration to inaugurate this thing and looking at the events that have been lined up for the of one week i'm really impressed and really very happy to be part of this aggression especially when i looked at virtual student seminar program all previous participants talking about some of the topics which uh, we usually teach in mtts as a student seminar and so on. i'm really very very happy okay and uh, the next two days talks also really impressive uh from the beginning i think professor kumareshan and all the members of mtts trust wanted curry leaf to grow independently of mtts trust i think they have done really proud and we are also very happy and proud of what they achieved and what they i hope this will continue to achieve a great uh, in a, i mean integrate lot of uh, alumni and try to offer uh, seminars by invited speakers as it has been doing for last two years and i'm very happy that uh, curry leaf is having its second anniversary and with these words and the formally i may say that i inaugurate this program okay thank you thank you very much thank you for your inaugural address sir yes we are indeed glad that we have joined together for the second year for curry leaf days now i would like to invite mr anbarasan from madras christian college chennai to give a walk through of currently events of the previous year anbarasan the mic is yours everyone i am happy to uh, give you a walk through through the events of curry leaf for the entire year 2021 2022 in a moment i will present to you so first to get into 2021 2022 we first need to see what we have done in the year 2020 and 2021 we have conducted 18 seminars as part of vssp 2021 a virtual student seminar program and there have been uh, 14 plus lectures by professors from all over india and there were several books released and by professor s kumareshan the founder of ntts trust next we'll get into the events in the year 2021 and 22 first we'll see the talks and seminars the first talk was given by professor abhijit champanekar from the university of new york city university of new york the title was unraveling knots for workers 
and uh, the date it held was mentioned here february 19 and 20 it held over two sessions and the links are available here you can check uh, the curry leaf youtube channel to watch the uh, lectures the second talk was on the topic linear groups by professor amba habib a faculty at and head of the department at shivnada university the third one was a workshop on LaTeX by a graduate student, Mr. Aryaman Maitani, uh, from the University of Utah. He was doing his uh, BS in mathematics at IIT Bombay when he was delivering the workshop. And the fourth one in the row was uh, a talk by Gan Kota on the top, the remapping theorem via the Dirichlet problem. He held over four during September 2022. And then we will enter the interview series that as part of the events. The first interview was uh, by Professor Abhijit Sampanirkar, a professor at City University of New York. This interview is part of the MDTS in my life series that has been in the YouTube channel. You can watch that. The second one was by Professor Ajit Kumar. This is also a part of MTTS in my life series held in May 6, 2022. The third interview was of Professor A.V. Jayanthan, a faculty at IIT Madras. This interview is also a part of MTTS in my life series and it held on May 6, 2022. The next interview was of Professor Arindama Singh held on September 4, 2022. It's a general interview on mathematics. And the next interview is of Professor Baba K. Sharma, a professor at IIT Gauhati, held on September 5, 2022. It's also a general interview on mathematics. The next interview was of Professor H. Anand Narayan, an assistant professor at IIT Bombay. This interview was held on September 10, 2022. This is also a general interview on mathematics. So in overall, to sum up, we had three lectures over eight sessions and three general interviews on mathematics, three interviews as part of MTTS in my life series and one workshop on LaTeX. So now I'll present to you the schedule of MTTS uh, Curry Leaf Days 2022. So this is the Curry Leaf website, Curry Leaf Days 2022 website. And here we have uh, four days of events with speakers from, with total of 11 speakers. The event starts with the inaugural session, which is happening now from 10.30 to 11.30. The second event in our list is an invited talk by Dr. Venkata Balaji on the topic, what is complex analysis and why it should be learned. This schedule to be held on at 11.30 uh, to 1 p.m. The next in our list is an invited talk by Dr. Raki Banerjee on the title, Teaching and Learning of Mathematics Inside Algebra. It is scheduled to be held at 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. today. And the next is a workshop on LaTeX delivered Mr. Kiran P. As titled Creating Presentations Using LaTeX. It is scheduled to be held at 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. today. And today's ending event will be virtual seminars of students, which will be premiered on the YouTube channel of Curry Leaf. At 6 p.m., it ends by 7 p.m. And then we'll move on to the day two schedule, which is tomorrow. The first event tomorrow is an invited talk by Professor Brindavan Sapu on the title Sums of Squares from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. tomorrow. The next in our list is a panel discussion which involves eminent panelists, Professor Geeta Venkatram, Professor Tulsi Srinivasan, Professor Ajit Kumar, Professor Chandra Shekhan, and Professor Krishna Hanumantu. On the title Mathematics Beyond the Mainstream Classroom. This is scheduled to happen at 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. tomorrow as part of our day two events. And day two is also ends with some seminars of, uh, as part of a virtual student seminar program 2022. 
as scheduled uh, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And then we'll have our day three events on 5th November 2022, which has uh, events from PTMT. PTMT is a pedagogical training for mathematics teachers. So we have our uh, first event as part of PTM introduction to PTMT on the title PTMT, the idea, objective and glimpses by speakers, Mr. Omkar Devlekar, Mr. Franshu Mahipal and Mr. Jaikaran Singh, which is scheduled at uh, 2 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. on 5th of November. And then the next event will be PTMT Talk 1 on the title Integration of Technology for Effective Teaching Learning by Dr. B. Srenranath Reddy at 3.15 p.m. to 4 p.m. on 5th of November. And then third day events also ends with virtual seminar program from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. on 5th November. And then we have our last day events, birthday celebration of Professor Kumaresan and Curry Leaf. And the uh, Curry Leaf Days 2022 ends with the virtual student seminar program 2022 on that day, November 6th from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. So we have our panelists listed in the web page. You can have a go through of this if you go to the website and all the speakers have been listed. And we have the VSSP 20 speakers also listed with the organizing team in bottom. So you can go through these and have a good uh, day and uh, Thank you. Thank you, Anbarasan, for walking us through the previous events of Curry Leaf and briefing us about what's going to happen next in this Curry Leaf Days 2022. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Shreya Shachida for feedback um, in VSSP 2021, who is a beneficiary of VSSP 2021. And Ms. Shreya Shachija is, from, is a program associate in Wells Fargo and an alumnus of Department of Mathematics in Gahati. Ms. Shreya Shachija? Uh, hello, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, I'm sorry due to poor internet, I cannot turn the video on. Uh, so hello everyone, I'm Shreya. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, uh, reaching out to me. Like it's it feels so great connecting after a really long time. Uh, a huge shout out to the Curry Leaf team for organizing such an amazing uh, event. I have been a part of the organizing team. So I understand the amount of uh, work you people do along with your daily course. It get hectic at times. So uh, to all the participants, uh, do make proper use of this uh, to add new things uh, in your knowledge base. Uh, there are some really informative talks, workshop, etc., which are being uh, lined up for you after this. Um, previous year, I was uh, one of the speaker at VSSP, that is Virtual Student Seminar Program. Uh, to those who do not know, uh, I'll just quickly tell, uh, we had about 20 minutes to present a, a topic, uh, followed by around 10 minutes of Q&A. It was a really good initiative started by uh, Curry Leaf. Uh, I still remember I was uh, very nervous uh, before my uh, seminar, but thank you to Curry Leaf and my mentor Satya sir for giving me the opportunity. Not only uh, it boosted my confidence uh, back then, but I understand how to efficiently deliver the right material in a limited uh, time frame, And it obviously helped me later in my MSc also. Uh, so all the best to all the speakers and uh, coming to the attendees uh, it's a do not miss kind of event for you all as you will learn a lot through uh, these sessions uh, you will understand different approaches to the topic that you might have already studied you might think i know i know this topic why do i need to attend the seminar for this but even then i recommend you to attend those sessions because uh, your peer might approach the pro problem statement in altogether a different way. So you'll learn a lot through that and make uh, the right use of the Q&A time for uh, proper knowledge transfer. 
and uh, i don't think you should be afraid to ask uh, questions during uh, the seminar or any workshop or uh, even any talk uh, in the end uh, i would just like to conclude by thanking curry leaf for organizing such events which uh, binds us all together by promoting the mathematics culture so yeah thank you so much yeah that's my time over to you thank you um thank you um thank you shreya sachida for your uh, wonderful feedback indeed i guess we'll make sure that to make the most of the vssp program and to broaden uh, our knowledge in various dimensions thank you now i would like to invite ms narmada wa teaching faculty in uh, bishlab junior college nagpur and she is a beneficiary of uh the part uh, of the latic workshop which was conducted in the previous year namrata miss miss namrata um okay i guess ms namrata is unavailable for now and then when she get back to us uh, we'll continue with the feedback and we have few feedbacks few written feedbacks and we would like to um uh, address them in absence sure so ms mukta from um rp goget college of arts and science and abi goket college of commerce ratnagiri has said that she got highly motivated to start writing in latic after attending the latic workshop organized by the karidi and in fact she has started writing some small documents and she is very happy to share with you that the overleaf document where uh, mr aryaman shared with all the participants on the day turns out to be very useful to her and she uses it frequently as reference uh, i guess overleaf is the online platform where you can edit and uh, share latic documents also she is writing also she adds up that she is trying to use different features of latic like plotting graphs taking inspiration from the workshops and uh, she also says that she is very grateful to the karleaf team for the organizing such a wonderful event and she wishes us all the best to organize a lots of event uh, like this in future and indeed we are here for karleaf days 2022 and we have a lot of nice events thank you for your feedback ms mukta and there's another Uh, there is another alumnus from pondicherry university and ms saswa ms saswata kuha says that vssp is an integral part of mtts just like the mtts offline seminars and uh, she was a student of mtts level 2 in 2021 and level o in 2019 and uh, she adds up that vssp gives her a lot of confidence like the mtts 2019 oh, offline camp he's a boy actually yeah and oh oh yeah okay fine i'm sorry and uh, he says that he enjoys thoroughly preparing for the seminar on uh, the intuitive approach of intuitive approach to the quotient topology then while he delivers it before an audience of mtt students he adds up that it is always challenging and it is also satisfying um he also adds up that it has helped him a lot improving his presentation skills yes indeed even i am a beneficiary of mtts level 2 Yes. Um I would like to again call uh, Ms Namrata to like to make herself available to share her feedback on latic workshop which was conducted with the previous years. Ms Namrata are you here? Uh Ms Namrata is here but she seems to be having a, a network issue. She might uh, text uh, her uh, feedback in the chat. yeah okay thank you yes. thank you and being said all the feedbacks now we'll move on what our faculty advisor says about us i would like to invite dr satinarayan reddy associate professor of department of mathematics okay thank you kari leaf yeah what to say about uh, mtd salumane wonderful actually they are really great means lot of team work 
as an advisor i got an opportunity to see all this young minds and a uh, lot of uh, motivation and a lot of uh, uh, new ideas different different programs how to conduct so many meetings and uh, every meeting again very optimal they will think a lot before coming to the meeting and uh, so luckily uh, as you as you saw, saw here they are very professional means uh, so many events are conducted in the last two years but they showed events only in 2022 so actually you know that uh, people try to show off many things already all the events right but they showed only 2022 so it is because it is curry curry leaf days for 2022 they are confined to that and not only that you you can see that how many events already happened now going to Are... in this curry leaf curry leaf day no. itself right so uh, actually i am very thankful to mtts trust giving this opportunity i am talking on behalf of uh, professor jayanthan and uh, me and uh, yeah to, as i told you they are going to be uh, great administrators that i can say that is the best way to say uh, so really great uh, to work with them and getting so many ideas from them actually so how to motivate people and combine and uh, so in year by year how to change the team also how to continue this for a longer period they are actually wonderful ideas they have i hope this will continue further and further so but i am a big appeal to the mtts alumni lot of work these people are doing see please come forward and help them what is that you have to do main one of the main thing you have to do is that please attend all of these and spread this events you spread the events to mtts alumni first right there are a lot of empty days alumni still not aware of so i request you that you people spread it and then to get benefit of this okay and uh, other thing is that uh, you also come forward you are going to be good positions later sometime so please come and give talks here their main purpose goal is that it is uh, all the talks everything has to be come from the empty days alumni right so you come and share with your ideas and all so that is very very essential and i am thankful that the ptmt people participants also started interacting and uh, uh, helping them so in particular uh, there are many people it is not good to say all the names because all of them are doing it is a team work right mtts means always team work so for example but i still i say a few names monika singh garima franshu omkar jekaran there are so many people all ptp ptm alumni they are now come came forward so uh, so a lot of discussions happened and they are also trying and i hope that ptmt joining will help them to boost further because there are many of them are faculty i hope many uh, people come forward now to give talks and share their experiences how mtt has changed in their life right they want to share but uh, now the platform came right so i request i will appeal all mtts alumni and ptmt alumni and all the other faculty earlier faculty and all please come forward and share your ideas and uh, uh, give big boost to mtts uh, this uh, curry leaf team thanks actually yeah thank you for giving this opportunity thank you professor so much for such a short note on uh, how to work as mtts alumnus we'll spread the word to everyone and we'll make sure that everyone is benefited through career day face um the next meeting comes on 11:30 and it's by professor venkata balaji from department of mathematics iit madras on the title what is complex analysis and why should it be learned so the event is at 11:30 with the same zoom and the youtube link uh let's take a short break and yes uh i would like to like um say that uh professor kumarasen is here and uh, sir would you like to share something to us uh, no okay fine thank you so much sir yeah so we'll take a short break until 11:30 and then we'll be back with the same youtube link thank you the next meeting is also on the same zoom link uh, if you want, people want you can stay back or take a short break and come back again with the same zoom link thank you
Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, let me just set up these things. Uh, yes, sir. My uh, I'm trying to join through uh, through you know the uh, the other tablet. Oh, okay. Sir.
Yeah, so this sound, is it coming from my uh, thing? So let me... So uh, it seems to have stopped now. Uh, just put really, uh, Okay, so uh, I am trying to share content and it says only the host can share content. Uh, Elan, are you there? Uh, yeah, uh, we are making uh, the other account as co-host as well. Uh, give me a minute, sir. Sure, yeah, okay. Yeah, I unmuted and then I realized that this uh, sound is not coming from my fan, at least. So it's from somewhere else. Uh, sir, you should be able to share now. Can you try? Okay. Yeah, okay. So uh, let me try that. Uh, I think I have to just pair my pen to the tablet. Uh, yeah, okay. It's paired now. And. Um, Yeah, so, so I hope this is uh, visible. Yes, uh, sir, it's visible. Yeah, I'm just. Uh, uh, yeah, no, this this, this uh, sound is, uh, I don't know from where it is coming. Uh, is it from my side? Somebody who has, uh, Ellen Jaren, probably uh, from your. Uh... Yeah, if there are more participants, uh, you can probably also uh, post the YouTube streaming link, you know, uh, which they can watch. Yes, sir. Uh, we are currently doing that when for the people who are in the waiting room. Must be only from your side because all others were muted. Ah, okay, okay. So I uh, let me try one thing. I'll just switch the fan off. Hope that if you are using a USB hub, the connection may not be stable. 
no, I've used this uh, several times. It's not a USB hub, but uh, uh, it, the, the sound uh, rhythmically looks like a sound due to a fan. So I've, I've switched it off. So I hope now everything is fine. So uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, should we wait for some more people to join? No, sir. I think we will uh, start. Yeah. Uh, we, can, we can start. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Harini, can you start the recording? Over to Priyanka. Okay. Very good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to the first invited talk of Curry Leaf Days 2022. I'm really happy to have my teacher, Professor Vengeda Balaji, as an invited speaker. He will be delivering a talk on the topic, what is complex analysis and why it should be learned. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Balaji to you. He did his PhD from Chennai Mathematical Institute. Currently, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics, IIT Madras. His research area includes geometry, especially algebraic and complex geometry and modelized spaces. As many of you might have aware, he has given a great lecture series as a part of NPTEL courses on algebraic geometry, Riemann surfaces and algebraic curves, and advanced complex analysis, which you can access in the YouTube. Without further ado, I request Balaji sir to take the stage. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Priya. So uh, I should first thank uh, Professor Kumaresan and, uh, you know, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, appreciate the long, uh, you know, uh, services of the MTTS uh, uh, headed by him, uh, which has gone a long way in, you know, uh, helping the mathematical community, especially the students to understand mathematics and appreciate mathematics. And uh, of also this initiative of Curry Leaf uh, Club, which is uh, supposed to be made up of MTTS alumni. That's a very nice initiative. And uh, it is very, very timely because these days uh, we see that uh, there is a, a somehow uh, a declining, uh, you know, interest in uh, registering for, you know, pure courses. And uh, though, of course, pure or applied is a very, very, you know, highly subjective uh, kind of uh, opinion. But then the point is that uh, the uh, you do something in life because you really love it. Okay. And so you have to find reasons to love it. So that way, uh, this is a very good initiative and it's a great honor and pleasure for me to tell you something about, uh, uh, you know, uh, complex analysis. So, uh, so let me, uh, let me get uh, away, uh, you know, uh, so I hope I'm, I'm going to write on this, uh, on the screen. Uh, please let me know if uh, you have any difficulty. Um, I'm using the, the Wi-Fi inside uh, IIT Madras, I, which is usually quite stable. So if there is any issue with audio or with video, uh, you're not able to see uh, something uh, or hear something, please uh, tell me. Uh, so, le so let's uh, begin. So you see, uh, so, the, so the important thing is that, you know, I, I would like to give a historical perspective uh, very quickly. You see, at least with respect to my, uh, you know, uh, encounter with complex analysis. So you see, I did uh, BSc about uh, maybe 35, 38 years ago. And uh, I, I did it in Madras University. You know, I was a student of Loyola College and we were following the Madras University syllabus. And in the third year uh, of the BSc, we had complex analysis as a subject, okay? And uh, the, the book that was prescribed was Ch by Churchill and Brown. It's a good book, it's a, it's a highly, uh, it's more, for you know, engineers and applied mathematicians. Uh, though there are sketches of proofs, but there's a lot of applications. And uh, then, but nowadays as I see things have changed. Uh, for example, when I joined IIT about 15 years ago, uh, then what happened is that um, complex analysis was a very important subject. And I, I believe all branches of engineering were supposed to take it. But then over the years, this has come down and now only a few branches uh, take it, uh, for example, aeronautical and computer science and uh, maybe electrical, of course, electrical. Okay. So whereas other branches uh, kind of neglected, but still there are students from those branches who come in. But I have always insisted that, you know, complex analysis is something that every engineer or scientist must learn. Okay. And uh, so I hope that, you know, people who are the students who are, you know, watching this, uh, will develop some enthusiasm and interest for complex analysis and we'll learn it. 
Okay. So uh, as I told you, the the first uh, yeah. thing. That you, yeah. Is uh, did somebody say something? Okay. So uh, so please do not hesitate to ask uh, if you have any questions or uh, you know uh, you're, you're welcome. Okay. So you see now. Uh, the 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 first thing that you should ask uh, you know whenever you do for that matter anything in life uh, why should you do it okay so what is the motivation for doing it and of course uh, the uh, usually the most common thing is that you do something because you like it you enjoy it so you know the, this gives a very very simple formula see if you if you really want to uh, you know love something that you do or do something that you love okay uh, which is kind of tautological you you know you 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 be you enjoy what you want to do so find what uh, makes you very joyful. Okay. So in that sense, uh, one could do, uh, one should study mathematics with a sense of joy, uh, with a sense of, you know, enthusiasm, uh, with a sense of thrill, with a sense of discovery. And uh, so therefore, you know, sh you should be attracted by uh, any topic because of the enthusiasm uh, that it generates. Uh, it, 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 it opens up some new mysteries, okay, for you. And then it opens up some very beautiful, uh, you know, uh, geometric things that you can visualize, uh, or it gives you a very aesthetically, you know, mentally aesthetically pleasing mathematical structure, intellectual. This is an intellectual kind of, you know, pursuit. So, uh, so one of these reasons uh, should draw you to a subject. And in the case of, uh, and of course, I should tell you, uh, for practicalities, you know. Uh, the subject may help you in solving day-to-day -day problems, okay? And then the subject may help you in doing, uh, you know, uh, things that were not otherwise easily possible, okay? So, uh, so these are the applications. And in all these aspects, complex analysis uh, has its contributions, okay? So I will, so the first, uh, you know, uh, rise on the a three, as they say, the, the reason for existence, uh, first of all, uh, if you want to talk about, you know, functions of a complex variable, or which is what is called as complex analysis, okay. Uh, so you know the 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 way the name comes is very obvious. You all we have all studied real analysis, and what is real analysis? Basically, you take one real variable, usually you call it as x, and then you take a function of that f of x, and usually this function is also real valued, and then uh, you want to study the function f of x, okay. And uh, what do you normally study is that you first study its continuity which is a completely topological kind of idea. And then you go on to study the rate of change of the function. And that's, uh, you, you start studying derivatives by taking the limits of the, you know, different quotients. And uh, then of course, uh, you also would like to uh, study, you know, uh, summation of the function values, which leads to, you know, for example, finding areas and volumes. And that is essentially the theory of integration. So. Uh, this is for functions of one real variable. And now you can imagine what uh, similarly complex analysis means. It means that you are dealing now with functions of one complex variable, okay, at least to begin with, okay. Uh, and, and then uh, this function of one complex variable will take complex values. And then you want to study uh, uh, its continuity, you want to study its differentiability. Then you want to study the integration theory, okay? So that's what complex analysis is all about. That's a very simple answer. But then, even before complex num uh, analysis, we go to we have the complex numbers. So the first question you should ask is that you know why do we need complex numbers at all to begin with? So uh, so what I am going to do is that you know I am going to give uh, connections uh, uh, with various important you know pillars of mathematics. So uh, the pillars of mathematics, the standard pillars are those of algebra, uh, you know, then uh, topology, and then uh, you know if you want uh, analysis, okay, and then of course uh, more more uh, deeper things such as differential geometry and so on, okay. And uh, the modern view of geometry is that you know any any mathematical object should be seen from all these viewpoints. So you should look at it from an algebraic point of view. You should look at it from a topological point of view. You should also look at it from a differential geometric point of view, okay? And then you should look at it from an analytic point of view, okay? And uh, and so on. And you have these various points of view, and they give you various 
perspectives uh, of the object and we put all these together and you get a wholesome view of the object and that uh, is what one would call modern geometry okay so what i will try to do is that i will try to help uh, help this uh, you know uh, uh, to some extent attempt i should say you know uh, to bring this connection of complex analysis with various important branches of mathematics okay so the the beginning thing is that you know uh, that of uh, uh, so uh, so let me write so you see we have uh, the first question you ask is why why complex numbers to begin with and you know uh, the the so this is the first question you ask and uh, then uh, i believe many of you know the answer so the idea is that you know uh, so this is a this is an algebraic you know uh, viewpoint uh, and the algebraic viewpoint is that you know you uh, we start with uh, the whole uh, one of the most basic things that you do in mathematics which is uh, you know the beginnings of number theory is that you have number systems and uh, you, abstractly a number system can be just in a simple in, in a simple way thought of as you know uh, a system where you can add and you know uh, subtract and divide and multiply okay and then uh, the idea is that you know once you have a system of numbers then uh, the aim is to try to solve equations. And then uh, the problem is that sometimes solutions to those equations will not lie in the, in the number system. So you have to expand the number system to accommodate the solutions. And then this leads to, you know, a theory of extension of number systems, okay? And uh, the point about complex numbers is that uh, that, is a, that is a kind of uh, an end to this, that leads to the end of this, this process, okay? So, uh, and that is what is called as the fundamental theorem of algebra. So basically what one does is that, you know, one starts with the, uh, you know, the natural numbers, which are the counting numbers. And then there is of course uh, addition. Uh, and of course there's also multiplication, okay. And uh, so, so let me write it like this. Then what happens is that this, uh, if you, now the moment you have this, uh, you know, number system, uh, then you try to solve equations and you, the easiest equation you can write is x plus one equal to one. And uh, mind you, this equation involves the variable x, it's a linear equation and it involves the number one, okay? And it, you, it, it involves addition, which is defined in the system. And the solution to this is of course, x equal to zero. So zero is not there. So you expand the number system, you add zero to the natural numbers and you get the whole numbers, okay? And that is also, uh, that also carries, uh, you know, the, this addition and multiplication. And again, what you do is that, you know, you try to solve an equation such as x plus, uh, let us say two equal to one, okay. Then what happens or, or even, you know, if I put x plus one equal to zero, okay, here, then you know that you're uh, going to get negative numbers. And therefore what you have to do is that you extend this to, you know, integers and, uh, under, and then again, you have this addition and multiplication. And once you go to integers, it's a kind of very nice system that you know every equation of the form uh, you know x plus m equal to n has a solution and uh, this is just x equal to n minus m as you know that is a solution where m and n are integers and uh, therefore this system is very nice it's closed under uh, you know uh, forming solutions of such equations and that's the reason why it is a group under addition okay and then uh, now that means addition is over the next thing is you worry about multiplication and then, you know, you uh, instead of uh, uh, using addition, you try to use multiplication and then you write equations and try to solve them. Then immediately, you know, you get into trouble. So for example, you know, uh, uh, so suppose I write something like, you know, x plus x into m is equal to n, okay. Then, uh, and, and of course, you know, uh, assume that m is not zero. Then the solution is of course, x is equal to n by m. Okay, and this n by m is no longer an integer, it's a rational number. So what you do is that you have to expand integers to the rational numbers. And again, you have your addition and multiplication. And lo and behold, uh, at this point, it's very, very beautiful. You get the field, it's, so this is a field. So the point is that, you know, uh, when you come to the integers, this is a ring, but it's not a field because not every uh, non-zero element is invertible. If you invert integers, you in general get rational numbers. But so if you go to rational numbers, it's a field. And then uh, once you go to rational numbers, you know, you are able to solve equations like this. So it's, it's very, very nice. But then uh, what has happened is that so far we have been looking at only, uh, only one power of the variable X. That means we are only looking at linear equations. The, then you start asking why stop with linear equations, try to solve higher degree equations. Okay. 
to say you, so in general higher degree equations are polynomial equations in one variable you want to solve them and then you know uh, the question is uh, the, the solutions will not lie here for example if you try to solve something like you know uh, you know x squared uh, minus 2 equal to 0 okay then the the solution is plus or minus square root of 2 which is you know is not rational okay so that means that you have to further you know expand this number system but there's something that happens here uh, that the this this uh, see up to this point this whole you know uh, uh, this whole expansion is kind of algebraic in the sense that you know you are trying to solve equations and the moment you know that some solutions are not there you put the solutions back into the number system and then make it a bigger number system so it's purely uh, solving equations but then when you go from rational numbers on uh, onwards then there is uh, something topological that is happening you know if you take the rational numbers on the real line then you know there are a lot of holes and these are the irrational numbers and you have to fill in those holes to get the real line and this filling in of holes is what is called as completion. So there is something topological that, that happens at this point. It is not just algebraic, it's topological. And then you end up with the real numbers. So you have the real numbers under addition and multiplication. Okay. And once you have the real numbers, then you know uh, the, the, the advantage of the real numbers is that you get uh, you know, uh, solutions, you get also the irrational numbers. You see, uh, root two is there, minus root two is there. So uh, those, those, those kind of solutions come in. And of course, uh, the beauty is that uh, there are many uh, uh, numbers which are not of that type that come in. These are the transcendental numbers. These are numbers which cannot come as zeros of you know, uh, polynomial equations with integer quotients. For example, E, you know, the base of the natural logarithm E, and then pi, you know, which is the circle constant. Okay. Uh, these are all, you know, they are all, you know, uh, they are not, uh, you know, uh, they are not what are called as algebraic. That means they don't come as zeros of algebraic equations. Okay, they are what are called as transcendental numbers. Okay, but then finally the question is that you know you can ask with with real numbers also you can ask this question. Uh, suppose I take a polynomial with real quotients. Okay, uh, don't uh, don't worry about integer quotients or rational quotients. You even take real quotients. Take a polynomial with real quotients. Uh, can you get all the zeros in the real numbers? And the, again, the answer is no. That means you have to expand the real numbers. And you know, this is what leads to the complex numbers. So you see the complex numbers are, uh, they, they, uh, they are a result, you know, of trying to solve equations. Okay, with real coefficients, polynomial equations, with re real coefficients. And the point is that you can again ask this question for the complex number system. Suppose I take a polynomial over complex numbers, okay, with complex coefficients. Uh, will all the zeros be there? And then uh, the answer is yes. So the answer is that's the fundamental theorem of algebra. It says that you take any polynomial, you know, with uh, in in one complex variable, and then uh, all the zeros are complex numbers. So you don't have to further expand the you know complex numbers into a bigger number system to solve you know uh, polynomial equations. And uh, so this is so uh, so you you the expansion or extension uh, of number systems you know this stops here and that is essentially the so called fundamental theorem of algebra which says that you take any polynomial non constant polynomial in one variable and uh, with complex coefficients then all its zeros all the zeros are there there are as many zeros as the degree of the polynomial. Zeros should be counted with multiplicities, which means some zeros can be repeated. But if you count with multiplicity, then the total number of zeros which is equal to the degree of the polynomial. All those zero, all those zeros will be complex numbers. You don't have to further extend the field of complex numbers. So this is called the fundamental theorem of algebra. Okay, and so you see the complex numbers serve that purpose that they they uh, they uh, have this property that you know. Uh, any polynomial equation uh, with uh, in in that system, you know, uh, has zeros. And in fact, there's something more serious. You may ask, uh, you know, uh, why are you stopping with one variable? You could have as well taken several variables. So why shouldn't I take n variables and take a collection of uh, several polynomials in n variables? Okay, and try to look at. Uh, common zeros of that. 
Okay, so this is a multivariable version, and the answer is even for that, complex numbers are enough. So this is a much much more you know deeper statement called the Hilbert Nullstellensatz. Okay, that you that you know even uh, if you solve try to solve polynomials, uh, you know in several variables and not just one polynomial but even a bunch of polynomials. Okay, you will get uh, solutions. You don't have to extend the. You don't have to go to a bigger number field than the complex numbers. So you see, the complex numbers are therefore so important from an algebraic point of view. Okay, so uh, the and and uh, uh, this this fundamental theorem of algebra is kind of so basic. It it is an algebraic mind you. It's an algebraic statement. It involves polynomials, and you are trying to say that every polynomial has a has uh, as many uh, zeros. As the degree of the polynomial, and all these zeros are complex numbers. But then, how do you prove this? So the big deal is that you know uh, this is an algebraic statement. You will expect to prove it using algebra, and uh, basically using some Galois theory. But then, uh, which is uh, you know field theory essentially, okay? Because after all, you are looking at complex numbers as an extension field of real numbers, okay? Now, uh, or or of rational numbers, if you want. But you see, the e easiest proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra comes from complex analysis. Okay, so uh, in complex analysis, uh, you study functions of one complex variable, and then there is this very beautiful theorem called the Liouville theorem. Okay, which says that you know if you have a function of one complex variable that is defined throughout the whole uh, complex plane, okay, that means for all complex values, and suppose it is differentiable everywhere once, okay. And if the image of the function is bounded, then the function is a constant. Okay, so so a function that is differentiable everywhere is called an entire function. And uh, if a bounded entire function is constant, that's what is called as Liouville's theorem. So using the Liouville's theorem, you have a very easy proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. So the the uh, on the one hand, complex numbers themselves are important from an algebraic point of view. Because they, uh, start, they with them ends the quest for you know expanding the number systems. And why do you want to expand the number systems? Because you want to solve equations. Every time you are not able to solve equations, it means that there are some uh, some roots of some equations uh, which you have to include in your number system so you have to expand it. Okay, but this expansion process stops with the complex numbers. That's the that's the importance of complex numbers. And then uh, trying to prove this statement, which is the fundamental theorem of algebra, that the easiest proof that is possible. Uh, in 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 a way you know uh, easily accessible is through complex analysis. Okay, so at least from this point of view, you know you have a uh, you have a race on the ethere why uh, you know you should have complex numbers and complex functions. Okay, so so that is uh, the the first thing I would like to begin with. Then you know uh, so this is these are all connections with with algebra. And uh, you know, uh, so if I before I go further, let me stray a little into you know uh, into other things. So let me say something about you know. Uh, so what is the uh, so uh, I, I stray a little into uh, some other motivational questions. So you know, so let me put a viewpoint. Uh, so just let me use a different color uh, viewpoint. Of uh, you know analysis, so so you see, uh, so I want to say several uh, little things here. So you see, the first thing is that you know uh, the so let us look at you know uh, uh, a very simple function. Uh, let's write this function f x is equal to one by one plus x y, okay, where x is a real number. So you see, this f is a function from R to R, right? And this is a very nice function because you know this. Uh, I have put this one plus x squared in the denominator, and x is real, so x squared plus one will never vanish. Okay, and therefore, uh, and one plus x squared is a polynomial. It's uh, infinitely differentiable. It's even, you know, uh, uh, it's it's even uh, it's even analytic in the sense that it has a Taylor series. In the Taylor series, is if you take the Maclaurin series at the origin, it's exactly this polynomial itself. Okay, so. And you are inverting that polynomial, and that's not a problem because the pol polynomial never vanishes. Now you see this is a very nice function. This is a, this is a, so you know there is a hierarchy when you when you look at real functions, okay, from the point of view of differentiation, okay, there is a hierarchy, 
So, you know, there are continuous functions which need not be differentiable. Okay. Then there are continuous functions which are differentiable. Of course, differentiable implies continuous. Okay. Then, but the derivative need not be continuous. Okay. Then there is a next hierarchy which is, you know, derivative is continuous, but the derivative is not further differentiable. That means you don't have second derivative. And, you know, this goes on and on and on. So, there is a, so in the real functions, you have this hierarchy. So, you have continuous functions which are not differentiable. Then one step higher, you have differentiable functions which are of course continuous, okay? But the different, the, the derivative need not be continuous. Then you can, you will have, you know, functions whose derivatives are continuous, but the derivatives are not further differentiable, which means the second the derivative does not exist, okay? So you have this very nice hierarchy and this is a very strict hierarchy. That means at every level, you can find a function which does not belong to the next level, okay? And uh, so let me tell you at the outset, what is the mystery with complex analysis is that such a hierarchy does not ex ex exist, okay? So it is a magic that you should really appreciate that once differentiable is infinitely differentiable. Not only infinitely differentiable, you can write, once it is infinitely differentiable, you can write, you, you get by the derivatives, the Taylor coefficients, you can write the Taylor series. And then the fact is the Taylor series converges. So uh, it even becomes what is called as analytic. So it is representable by a convergent power series. Okay, so this comes out of just one's differentiability. Okay, and this is something that is that distinguishes complex analysis from real analysis. Okay, so for this, you know, this kind of amazing property, that's one of the attractions of the theory. Okay, so you know, uh, so let me get back to this uh, thing here. You take this function f from r to r. You have this f x. Of course, you know, it is infinitely differentiable. You know, I can write a derivatives of any order. Then what I can do is I can write the Maclaurin series, which is I, that is, I can write the Taylor series uh, at the origin. Uh, that is Maclaurin series. And uh, you know, what is this? This is going to be summation n equal to zero to infinity. Uh, the Taylor coefficient will be the nth derivative at zero by factorial n into uh, x power n. So this is what it's going to be. Okay. And of course, fx, uh, f of x will, uh, so when I write this here, I mean, you know, it converges, the, the series on the right converges to this, uh, you have a Taylor expansion. And of course, you know, what you will get is, you know, if you write it, you know, you are going to get just one plus, you know, you'll get, you know, one. Uh, so, you know, this is just, uh, this quantity is just one plus x squared to the minus one. So you'll get one minus x squared plus x power four and so on. This is what you're going to get. Okay, this is the this is the series you're going to get. Now, this, as you know, this is uh, you know the theory of geometric series, and you know this converges only when mod x is less than one. Okay, so uh, you have this mod x less than one condition for this to converge, and whenever it converges, this represents this function one by one plus x squared. Okay, but then watch this. You see, if I draw the real line, okay, this is the origin. Now, where is this function nice? The function is nice everywhere. See, the function is actually infinitely differentiable. Okay. There's no problem with the function. It's differentiable everywhere. But strangely, when I write the Taylor series at zero, that is a Maclaurin series, what happens is that, you know, I get this interval. I get this uh, interval of convergence to be minus one comma one. That means only here, you know, this Taylor series works. So the question is, what is so special about this plus, plus one and minus one? Why is there a restriction in the Taylor series converging? You see, you of course, if you write the geometric series, you know that this is a geometric series converges only when the variable in modulus is less than one that you know. So that could be one uh, you know answer that you can give. But then uh, whatever it is, the question is, why is it that, you know, this, what is so special about this one and minus one? Why is the, you know, the Taylor series not working beyond that? Okay. Now, uh, the, the, if you want to really unravel this, okay, there's an easy way of unraveling this by going to complex variables. So what you do is you change the uh, variable X to a complex variable Z. And then, uh, therefore, the function will become complex valued. So what you do is that you write fz is equal to 1 by 1 plus z squared. Okay. Now, this will be from complex numbers to complex numbers. Okay. Now, if you do it like this, then you see something immediately. This function is no longer nice. Okay. It's not nice everywhere. 
If you write 1 by 1 plus x squared, that's nice everywhere for every value of x on the whole real line. But if you write 1 by 1 plus z squared, that's not nice because it vanishes. So you see what happens is that at z is equal to plus or minus i, you see this, this, this uh, denominator vanishes. So you see what happens is if you look at it as a function from the complex plane to the complex plane, okay, then what happens is that, you know, that is this plus i and minus i, okay. If you, uh, if you look at a region centered at zero, you see, you get this disc. Uh, this disc hits the real axis in plus one and minus one, and uh, it, it hits the imaginary axis, uh, the y-axis uh, in, in uh, you know, plus i and minus i. And then the thing is that, you know, you see that at, uh, there's really nothing wrong at one and minus one for the function. But really what is wrong is at plus and minus i. Okay, and that and it is a fact that you know whenever you write a series, the series expansion about a point is the the uh, the region where it converges always has central symmetry with respect to that point. Okay, so uh, that is the reason why in the case of real functions, when you write a series expansion around x naught, you get an interval of convergence x naught minus r x naught plus r where r is the radius of convergence, okay? So in the same way, if you, that is for one real variable, but if you do it for complex variables, you will get, a, you should get a something that is symmetric about the center of convergence. And there uh, in, in the plane, something that is symmetric about the center of convergence is actually a disk. So the truth is that what happens is that this, if I write, try to write this as a, a you know, as it's a Maclaurin series again, I get one minus z squared plus z power four, uh, you know, minus dot, dot, dot. But the point is, it will live only here. And the reason is because, you see, at plus i and minus i, you know, uh, the, the denominator uh, vanishes. The function goes to infinity. Okay. Therefore, the, the function is no longer well, well, well defined. Okay. That's the problem. And so you see now, if you go back to the real picture, why did, uh, why did it stop at 1 and minus 1? You see, the reason is because if you if you go to the complex variable, then you see the whole picture. Actually, where this uh, series is valid is the disk. But if you are looking at only the real line, you see only the portion from minus one to one. You don't see the, the problem is actually coming from this plus i and minus i, which are not visible when you are looking at only the real function. Okay. So what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is the following. Whenever you study a real valued function of a real variable, if you want to really know its properties, what you should do is you change the real variable to a complex variable and again, analyze that. function, And then you will see that many properties of the real function are actually, you know, coming because of reasons that you see when you change it into a complex function by changing the real variable into complex variable. So what is the model of the story? The model of the story is, see, even real analysis, if you want to do properly, okay, you have to change uh, the, the real variable to a complex variable. So, you know, it, it, in some sense, what this tells you is that, you know, if you want to understand your real analysis properly, if you want to understand the theory of functions of one real variable properly, you must take up the exercise of taking whatever function you're studying, which has a formula or expression in terms of a real variable X, change the real variable X into a complex variable Z, and again, do the analysis using complex analysis. That will give you, it will reveal as to why certain things are happening. So for example, in this case, as I told you. So, you know, this is another motivation to study complex analysis. So when you study complex analysis, what you should think is that complex analysis is a kind of, you should think of it as an enrichment of real analysis. It is an extension, okay? And it, it tells you many hidden things about real functions that you cannot directly see, okay? So that's that's one more motivation, okay? So uh, so let me go ahead with you know with with uh, with other things. Um, so the so the first thing is uh, so uh, you know uh, so uh, so this uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is you know again these are all concepts connected with analysis. Okay. So uh, uh, so for example, uh, there is this so this amazing thing, namely that uh, in in the in the complex variable case, once differentiable throughout an open set means infinitely differentiable throughout the open set. Not only that, 
once it is infinitely differentiable, you can write down the Taylor series. And then it means that locally, even the Taylor series will converge, which, and, and that means that every, even, you know, once differentiable function throughout an open set locally can be written as a power series. Okay. So this is the great theory of uh, complex analysis, uh, functions of one complex variable. And this is completely not true for one real variable because in one real variable, I can find a function which is differentiable, you know, but the derivative is not even continuous. Okay. These kind of things will not happen in complex analysis. Okay. Differentiable ones throughout an open set will give you, in fact, infinite differentiability. And in fact, what is called as, what you may call as analyticity, which is representation locally by power series. So let me write that. So, uh, so that's one of the, you know, uh, great distinguishing features that, you know, compels one to read complex analysis. Okay. And uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, you, if you, you just think about it, it's miraculous. Uh, I just say that derivative exists at every point, but of course, complex derivative. So what do I mean? So, you know, so let me write this down. So what you do is that, you know, you have the complex plane. Okay. And then maybe I take some nice, uh, so I, let me just, you know, take some, uh, let me concentrate at, at some point Z naught. Okay. And then, you know, I take a small disc around Z naught. Okay. Uh, and, you know, in this disk, open disk, I, I put it a dotted boundary for the boundary circle uh, because I don't want the boundary to be in included. I own, I'm only including things inside. So that's an open set. And then I have a function f, okay, uh, which is again going into complex uh, plane. Okay. So the so, so you, we write the function as w equal to f set. This is just like, you know, writing y equal to fx. X is the, uh, for real functions, x is the independent variable, y is the dependent variable. Okay. And uh, so x is the variable in the source uh, real line and y is the variable in the target real line. So it's from R to R. But now uh, what we are doing is that it's from complex numbers to complex numbers, the source complex variable is z, the target complex variable is w. Okay. And then you have this function at w equal to fz and what is the condition that we, you do is that, you know, throughout this uh, disk, okay, you assume that the function is uh, just once differential. Okay. And what does that mean? You know what it means? Uh, the, the, you know, the derivative exists. So that means that, you know, you just take any point, uh, z prime. Okay. Uh, I think maybe z prime is not a, uh, you know, uh, all right. It doesn't matter. So you see if, so let me write this. If dash of z prime exists uh, for every z prime in the disk, uh, open disk. Okay. So this is a very, very simple condition, uh, you know, uh, uh, so uh, uh, this is as you, uh, the, the derivative is defined as usual. So you'll just write limit, you know, z uh, tends to z prime, uh, f of z minus f of z prime by z minus z prime. This is your, uh, this, this exists and this is your f dash of z prime. So this is uh, the derivative definition is the same, but the only thing you must remember is that, you know, when you say z goes to z prime, that means, you know, you are trying to approach z prime from inside this disk. And uh, as you know, the way you can approach, there are many directions you can approach. And uh, in fact, I can even approach uh, in, a, in a fuzzy way, or I can go along a spiral or some funny curve, you know, uh, or in a probabilistic way also I can approach. Okay. So there's so much flexibility in approaching a point in more than one dimension. And that's probably the source of the power of the definition that once you have a function that is differentiable, uh, throughout this disk, then the amazing thing is that that function is actually infinitely differentiable. That means the derivatives of all orders exist. Okay. And once the derivatives of all orders exist, okay, then you write the Taylor series of the function, that Taylor series will converge back to the function. Okay. See, I must tell you what all this will completely go wrong in the case of real functions. First of all, if you have a real function that's differentiable once everywhere in an open set, there's no guarantee that even the derivative is continuous. If the derivative is continuous, there is no guarantee the derivative itself is once more differentiable. And if the derivative is once more differentiable, there is no guarantee that this, which is the second derivative, there is no guarantee the second derivative is continuous even. Then whether the second derivative is further differentiable, that means the third derivative exists, there is no guarantee. And even there is something like this. If all the derivatives exist, 
Okay, so such functions are called C infinity functions. Okay, so we write C one if first uh, you know derivative exists and is continuous. We write C two second derivative exists and is continuous. Okay, and C infinity is all uh, derivatives exist. And if all the derivatives exist, you can write the Taylor expansion because the Taylor coefficients are just given by the derivatives. Okay, derivatives at the center divided by the factorial. Okay, now. But the problem is, you write this Taylor series. The Taylor series uh, it can go bad. The Taylor series may not converge at all. That is one extreme case. Second thing is, it may converge, but it may go to some other function. Okay, you start with the function which is infinitely differentiable. Write the Taylor series. The Taylor series first of all need not converge. That's an extremely bad situation. The second thing is, it may converge, but it may go to some other function. So these kind of things can happen. This is what happens with real variables. But it doesn't happen with complex variables. Just and mind you, in complex variables, what do you have to assume throughout an open set? Just assume that the function is differentiable once, only once, just once, you know, uh, at every point. Then, lo, behold, it's, it's this is the magic of complex theory of complex analysis that it is infinitely differentiable, and you can write its Taylor series, and the Taylor series will converge back to the function. So that's an absolutely amazing theory, okay? and it has no parallel with real variables. Okay, so this is an amazing thing that happens that you know should kind of uh, whet your appetite as to try to see what is the theory behind this that makes this happen. Okay, and uh, that is one of the motivations uh, you know to learn complex analysis. Okay, so uh, so let me write this here. Uh, F uh, is then you know uh, infinitely differentiable. And has a Taylor series, so uh, uh, which converges back to F. So this is an amazing thing that happens. Okay, and again, uh, uh, at the risk of repeating it so many times, I want to caution you that this is completely uh, untrue uh, from what happens in the case of one real variable. Okay. Now, the, so you see, now once you buy the story that you know you have to really understand how just one one's differentiability uh, gives uh, so many times differentiability. So what is happening? Uh, how do you get the higher derivatives? So that again, something again, something very beautiful happens in complex analysis. See, normally there are two uh, kind of operations. There is a, a differentiation operation. And there is an integration operation. Okay, so these are the two main operations of calculus. Differentiation uh, leads to geometrically, you know, finding tangents and uh, rate of change and things like that. And integration leads to, you know, summing up. And usually, it is used to calculate areas and volumes and things like that. And they are, and you know, integration and differentiation are kind of, you know, opposite, uh, you know, uh, operations. So, for example, you know. Uh, so, so that is the next piece of motivation. So, uh, so let me write it here, uh, and that is to continue this story as how do you get this infinite differentiability from single differentiability? Okay. So, you see, uh, usually you start with a function f. Uh, let us say from uh, you know it doesn't matter. I could I could put it from an, an interval a b uh, on the real line into r. And you know, uh, I can do something with f. I I can uh, I that is that's differential calculus. And this is you know uh, trying to get whether f dash f double dash uh, exists. Do they exist? You can ask questions like this. This is the derivative. This is the study of the derivatives. Okay. And then the other thing you can do is that you can do integral. You can inter try to integrate from say some alpha naught to beta naught uh, f t t t. Where of course you know this alpha naught and beta naught is uh, they are uh, you know uh, this interval is contained in this a b so that it makes sense and uh, you know or you could even uh, so this is what is called a definite integral you can also have an indefinite integral so you know you can just put alpha naught to x uh, f t d t you can you and by making uh, the upper uh, you know limit as a variable you get a function okay now of course you know. Uh, the the this is this is integration. 
or what is called as integral calculus. Okay, and usually a real analysis basically uh, starts with continuity. Okay, and then you you study uh, you know integral calculus, you study differential calculus, and so on and so forth, and then you do probably carry it over from one function to families of functions. So you worry about sequences of functions and series of functions and try to integrate them, try to differentiate them and try to build up the theory in that that's what real analysis is all about, okay? And uh, you, of course, you know that integration and differentiation are the reverse, you know, reverse process, inverse processes. So, you know, so for example, you know that if you, the, if you der take derivative of this integral alpha naught to x ft dt, okay, okay. Then you know this is going to just give me you know f x minus f alpha naught. Okay, so uh, in in some sense, uh, so I should so let me write it correctly. So this is uh, you know uh, the so-called you know Newton Leibniz formula. So what is this Newton Leibniz formula? Uh, you integral you find integral of the derivative. Okay. Uh, then uh, these integral and uh, derivative they cancel. So you know integral, you know of uh, you know if I if I write uh, f dash of t dt, some let us say x naught to x, then this is just f of x minus f of x. Okay. So the you know this you have this kind of uh, uh, you know um, uh, you have this kind of uh, uh, relationship. Okay and uh, uh, j just uh, just let me uh, just hold on for a moment kindly uh, yeah sorry for that small um, uh, interruption so you see what i wanted to say is that you can uh, you can if you take the derivative and try to integrate Okay, you will get back the function. Okay, and the other thing is you can if if you take the uh, if you take the integral of a function and then differentiate it, you will also get back the function. Okay, so the moral of the story is that you know integration uh, and differentiation they are kind of inverse processes. Now, uh, what do you need to be able to integrate? You can integrate for to integrate a function. You need, you need it to be continuous. Okay, so you know when when I write something like this integral alpha naught to x f t d t f has to be continuous, then you know integral of a continuous function exists. Okay, and then if you differentiate this, you will get back the function. Okay, now uh, what happens in complex analysis? So this is again something very very beautiful. This is what should uh, I would say is one of the attractions of the theory, is that these two inverse processes integration and differentiation, they are actually married together in complex analysis. So what happens in complex analysis is that you get derivatives by integrating. Okay. So the, uh, so, you know, what does this mean? See, I've been telling you the beautiful thing in complex analysis is that if a function is differentiable just once throughout an open set, then it is infinitely differentiable. That means what? all higher derivatives also uh, exist. How do you know the higher derivatives exist? So from one, from, from a function which has one derivative, how do you get the higher derivatives? How are you getting higher derivatives? And here is where uh, is the beautiful thing. There is this great theory of Cauchy, Augustine Louis, Louis Cauchy, called the Cauchy integral theory. What this Cauchy integral theory says is that you do integration. After you do integration, you will find that the higher derivatives exist. So that is the beauty of uh, complex analysis. By doing integration, you, you, you prove that derivatives exist. And this is essentially Cauchy theory. And you know it is epitomized by what are called the Cauchy integral formulas. So you see, one of the most attractive uh, things to study in complex analysis is the so-called Cauchy integral. So what is this Cauchy integral thing? See, the Cauchy integral is the following thing. See, just like you know, in, in the case of uh, real functions, suppose I have a function f uh, which is continuous on interval. By integrating this function like this, integral alpha naught to x f t dt, that gives me a function which is uh, continuous, uh, which is actually differentiable because its derivative is just this function. 
Okay. That's because derivative and integral are, you know, inverses of each other. Now, what is the and uh, what is the complex analog of this? So the complex analog of this is this Cauchy integral. What is this Cauchy integral? So what you do is you take the complex plane. You just take any curve there. Okay. Take any curve there. Some curve. You think of a curve as you know continuous image of an interval. Okay. It does. Uh, it doesn't matter whether uh, you know. Uh, so far, for that matter, let's take it's a closed interval. So you have a curve like this. It's a continuous image, and you know. Uh, let's assume that the curve is nice enough so that you can, you know, uh, for example, uh, define an integral, a path integral on the curve. That means that the curve should be piecewise smooth. Okay. That means that the function that is map giving you this curve as the image of an interval, that function should be piecewise uh, once continuously differentiable as a function of one variable. Okay. That means what? It means that, you know, I have this, uh, that is this interval, closed interval AB on the real line. Okay. And then there is this, uh, there is this uh, function gamma t going to gamma t. This gamma t is now a point on this uh, curve. As at t equal to a, you start here. This is gamma a. This is the complex number. And at t equal to b, I get gamma b. Okay. As t moves from a to b, this curve is, uh, you know, you know, this curve is traced. Okay. And then the big deal is that you want this gamma to be, you know, uh, you know, good enough. So that you can do some integration on it, okay. Uh, and uh, what is the condition? The condition is gamma uh, dash of t uh, exists uh, and is continuous, uh, or you, you can relax this to at least piecewise. At least piecewise on this uh, interval a b. That means you can have finitely many points where it may not be differentiable, okay. But it has to be continuous, okay. And of course, you know, uh, the, the left and right limits uh, derivatives should exist, but they may not be equal. Okay. And the and in the sub intervals where you're dividing there, you know, the function has to, the derivative has to be continuous. So this is what is called as a piecewise, piecewise smooth curve. And this is what is called as a contour. These are the simplest things on which you can do path interface. Okay. Now you see, once you have something like this, so you give me a curve like this. Now, again, let me recall. How did you get this uh, function, uh, you, this, this integral function? What you did is you, on interval, you had a continuous function. By integrating it and making the variable, uh, the upper limit a variable, you get a new function. That function is actually de differentiable and its derivative is this function. So that is actually the antiderivative. And using that antiderivative to evaluate integrals is exactly the Newton Leibniz formula. Okay. Now, the in the same way, what you do is you give me this uh, this this contour as it is called, okay, piecewise smooth curve. And then what you do is on this, give me just a function h, give me a function h into c, which is you know continuous. Give me a continuous function. Okay. So you see, h is a continuous function just defined defined on that uh, on that contour. Okay, not on the whole plane. That means, you know, for every point uh, on this uh, curve, the H value is defined. Suppose I give you a function like that. Then here is the magic. The magic is take any other point Z not outside. Okay, or let me even call it Z, uh, Z outside. Okay, then what you do is you integrate over this gamma, okay, H, uh, so I will put uh, H uh, uh, zeta d zeta by zeta minus z. Okay. So you see this zeta. So I'm 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 calling a variable point on the you know on the curve as zeta. Okay. And therefore H is defined on the curve. So H of zeta makes sense. And d zeta is the you know uh, uh, variable. Uh, it's the integrating element. Okay. The zeta is the integrating variable, variable of integration. And then I'm putting in the denominator. So I'm putting this zeta minus z in the denominator. So what happens is you see, the zeta uh, is what is varying on the curve gamma. Okay. But this z is fixed. So if you, if you do this integral, what you should get is that you should get uh, uh, something that depends on uh, you know, z. Because when you do this integral, the integral is with respect to zeta. You are summing with respect to zeta. So zetas will go away after you do the integration. 
So whatever is going to be left out is only going to be dependent on Z. So if you call this function as capital H Z, okay, if you define it like this, then what this is doing is, you see, this is giving you a function H from the complex plane minus the image of gamma into the complex plane. And of course, why do I have to take the, uh, you know, uh, the points of gamma out? Because you see the denominator I'm putting zeta minus Z. Zeta is on the curve. Z should be outside the curve. If Z is on the curve, zeta minus Z can become zero when zeta comes to Z. And I'm, I can't put it in the denominator. So I have to take this Z outside the curve. Okay, so I'm looking at the complement of the curve and mind you the complement of a curve, the curve is an open set. Okay, and then uh, I have this function H and you get this function. So this is what is called the Cauchy integral of this uh, function. So how, do, how does a Cauchy integral come? It's very, very simple. Just take some nice curve and on that curve alone, give me a continuous function. That's all, I don't need anything more. I just need a continuous function on a curve. Then immediately outside that curve, I get this function and what is the magic? So here is a magic, this is called the Cauchy integral. The magic is this function H is infinitely differential. Okay. And you can get all its derivatives. Okay. By differentiating under the integral sign. And that is essentially, these are essentially, this is essentially the Cauchy theory. So the fact is that, you know, H is infinitely differential. Okay. And you know, uh, the uh, and its derivatives are given by differentiating under the integral sign. So here what, what I mean by that is you see HZ is just integral over gamma H zeta D zeta by zeta minus Z. How will you calculate H dash Z? You, you should expect you just do d by dz, but do it, uh, let it go past the integral. And only when you go into the integral, zeta, think of zeta as a constant and you're differentiating only with respect to z. If you do that, what you will get? One by zeta minus z is going to give you a minus one by zeta minus z, the whole squared. And then this zeta minus z is going to give you another minus one. So you'll get integral over gamma, uh, you know, uh, h zeta, uh, d zeta by zeta minus z, the whole squared. So the moral of the story is, you know, uh, and you can go on like this. Now, what, uh, what is the advantage of this? Okay. Of course, there, these things have to be proved, the, but the advantage of this is the following. The, the, the thing is that, you know, if you take, so I think uh, sometimes uh, maybe I am uh, missing a factor of one by two pi i, uh, probably. Uh, so what, what is the, so this is something that I have to, uh, this should be all right, but let me, let me write this. Um, uh, so, so let me get back to this older, older picture. See, suppose you have a disc, you know, where, uh, you know, uh, the, the function F is, suppose you have a function F, uh, W equal to F Z, and it is, uh, you know, you know, it's one, one time, once one time differentiable, uh, in the, in the disc. Okay. Then what happens is that you do the following thing. You suppose you want, you take any point z, right? okay? What you do is that you take a curve, for example, uh, something like a circle, okay? Going around that once, okay? So you take that to be your gamma and then you have this beautiful thing that the nth derivative of uh, f at z, which is d uh, n by d z n f of z, okay? This will turn out to be n factorial by two pi i integral over gamma uh, f zeta d zeta by zeta minus z, you know, to the power of n plus one. So you get this very beautiful thing. And this is actually a direct consequence of this. The, the fact is that you can differentiate under the integral sign. So you see what is happening. What is happening is, this is what is happening. You have this function f, which is differentiable once, okay? Why is it uh, differentiable many times? Why, for example, why is it differentiable twice? If you if you ask, okay, then uh, what you do is you see. In fact, it's uh, somewhat complicated. Uh, there is a little bit of complication here. When you say it's differentiable once, I only assume it's differentiable once. I don't even know that 
the derivative that I get, the first derivative that's even continuous, I don't know. Okay. For example, if I knew the second derivative exists, that means the first derivative is continuous. Okay. But what I assume is only first derivative exists as a function. I don't even know that the first derivative is continuous, but the point is even that is automatic. So that is the power of the Cauchy integral. So what happens is that you, this is what is called, these are called the Cauchy integral formulas. What they tell you is that, you know, they are essentially a, a way of, you know, uh, uh, differentiation under the integral sign. And because of this, one's differentiability implies infinite differentiability. You see, that's where the magic comes from. So the magic comes from the Cauchy integral. Okay. And uh, what you must also notice is that you see this, uh, if you look at this formula, this formula is, uh, there's some, there's more to it than meets the eye. See what this formula says is that if you look at this picture, uh, so is, is somebody, uh, uh, I, I, yeah, Professor Kumarasan, you have, you, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Balaji, are you assuming gamma is closed in the last equation, equation general formula? Because earlier you were dealing with only gamma a path. That's true. That's true. The here, here in so the question. Here general, you have to assume it's a closed. Yeah, I, I'm assuming gamma is a, what is called a simple closed path. It's going around the point set. Right. And and it which no, is you have to say about around the point, etc. Okay, you are oh you you are missing the winding number. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it if it is a point outside, then of course I will get. Zero. That's fine. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, so this is uh, what is usually in the, in the parlance of complex variables, we call it as, you know, uh, uh, simple closed contour uh, going around uh, the, you know, the point. And so the, see, the important thing now is that if you look at this formula, as uh, Professor Kumarasan very rightly pointed out, I, I, I put this in the picture, but I didn't say it. So, of course, in this situation, I am assuming that, you know, gamma is a closed path, which means gamma A equal to gamma B. So in this picture, you know, the starting point gamma A and the ending point gamma b are in general different but what i am assuming is that you know gamma a and gamma b are the same so it's actually a loop okay so it's a closed path and uh, then uh, but the, the 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 beautiful thing is that if you look at this formula see what is happening is that you know if you look at this integral what does this integral depend upon of course it depends on the point where you are trying to compute the nth derivative but look at the uh, integral in the integral what is that See, this integral, you have the, in the integrand, this zeta minus z to the n plus 1. That is all right, because that depends on the z, where you want the com computation of the nth derivative. But what else is there? You have this f of zeta, d zeta. Where is this f of zeta? The zeta is varying on the path, on the closed curve. That means, you see, you, this integrand depends, except for the z in the denominator, the rest of it depends on only f values on the on the curve on the on the on the boundary curve gamma that the, this whole integral depends on that and strangely enough that gives the uh, derivatives of the function so that means what see this function f its values on gamma they control all the values of all the derivatives of the function at every point inside that's the beauty that you have to appreciate see every point inside gamma and every derivative at each of those points, those values are completely controlled by just the f values on gamma. So that is the amazing point that has to be understood. Okay. So that is the really amazing part of Cauchy theory. Okay. So therefore, the moral of the story is that, you know, this is the, this is the key to understanding why, you know, uh, one's differentiability gives infinite differentiability. And what is the beautiful key? The key is that you have to, you get higher differentiability from one's differentiability by integrating. So you are, you are applying integration, which is the reverse process of differentiation to get higher uh, derivatives. So you see, this is what you have to really appreciate. This is the beauty of Cauchy's theory. So, th so this is another very, very beautiful thing. Then, you know, uh, the, so let me get back to, so this is some, see, this is some analytical motivation. Okay. Let me go on to give you some topological motivation uh, as to why one should do some complex analysis. So topology, so topological motivation. So you see, uh, so the, so what is topology all about? It's, you know, uh, you're basically, uh, you know, uh, you want to study 
continuity. You want to study how continuity you know uh, works. Basically, you want to study func. You know, you want to study um, what are called as topological spaces. And what are topological spaces? Topological spaces are you know structures on sets uh, for which you can define the notion of continuous function. Okay, and uh, so you you all know you must have studied. Uh, I don't know. Uh, sometimes I find that in some uh, in, in these days and in, in the undergraduate level, topology is not taught, but maybe at least people do metric spaces. Okay. But then the idea of topology is actually coming from metric spaces. So in metric spaces, you have what are called as open balls centered at every point. Okay. And uh, then these, all these open balls can be, uh, you know, these, they, they cover the whole space and then saying that the function is continuous is the same as saying that the inverse image of an open ball, uh, you know, uh, is a union of open balls. Okay, so in, in so that's how continuity is defined, mm -hmm. and then you you get an arbitrary topological space by replacing open balls with open sets. Okay, and so what is an arbitrary topological space? It's a set. It's a non-empty set which has uh, a certain collection of subsets called open sets, which behave, you know, very much like open balls. And what are those uh, uh, behavioral, you know, uh, uh, properties? They are listed as axioms of a topology. Okay, that you know, the the uh, this this collection of open sets should contain the null set, the whole space. It should be closed under arbitrary unions, and it should be closed under finite intersections. Okay, that is arbitrary union of open sets is open, and finite intersection of open sets is open. So once you have this collection of open sets uh, on a set, you know. Uh, collection of open subsets of a set uh, which satisfy these axioms. We say that we have given a topology to that set and it becomes a topological space. And if you give me two such topological space, a function is from one to the other is called continuous if the inverse image of open sets are open. Okay? So it's as simple as that. And the beauty of this is that you don't have to use a metric uh, to define uh, continuity of a function. And then we try to study uh, topological spaces up to isomorphism. And what is isomorphism? Isomorphism is, you know, in this, uh, in this, uh, so called category of topological spaces, isomorphisms are continuous functions whose inverses are also continuous functions. They are called homeomorphisms. Okay? These, uh, so looking at homeomorphisms is the same as looking at topological isomorphisms. So there is a very simple uh, question. What, what is the topology, topologically how do specific subsets of the complex plane look like? Okay? So the one of the reasons why complex analysis is so beautiful is that the topology of the complex plane itself is kind of very mysterious. There are some mysterious things happening there. And uh, somehow the easiest way to learn them is by complex analysis. So I'm going to give you two, uh, two examples. The first thing is the so-called Riemann. So I, let me start with just the most simpler thing, the so-called Jordan curve theorem. So what is this Jordan curve theorem? It's a, it's a very simple sounding theorem. So what it says is that, you know, you, you have a, so you start, so, you know, think of it like, you know, think of the plane as some region of uh, space, say uh, a garden or, you know, a region of the city, you start at some point, you go, you start traveling, you walk around. Okay. But then you make sure that you should not cross yourself. Okay. You should not cross your path, but you keep going, going, going everywhere. And then finally, uh, you, you can travel for a long time, but then finally you have to come back. Okay. So uh, when you do this, this is what is called as a Jordan curve. So uh, topologically, how do you define it? It is a continuous image. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a closed path, which is continuous image of an interval, but it should never cross itself. That means it should be, you know, uh, what is called simple. Okay. It should not cross itself, except that the starting point is the same as the ending point. Okay, so you can imagine from this picture that I have drawn, if I do something like this, then you know what happens is that for this curve, there is an inner portion that I'm shading. Okay, and then there is an outer portion that and then the outer portion is, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's like this. So this is the outer portion. Okay, there's an inner portion, there's an outer portion. And you can very well see that, you know, uh, the inner portion uh, has the property that, you know, it has no holes. Namely, uh, anything, uh, any any loop inside that can be completely shrunk to a point, and uh, the outer portion is actually connected. Okay, so the Jordan curve theorem is 
that the same result is true for an arbitrary curve which satisfies the Jordan curve conditions. Namely, it is a loop. So starting point is the same as ending point. And of course, it's continuous image uh, of a piece of the real line. And the other thing is that it should not cross itself. So it's simple. Okay. Now, what you must really appreciate is that as simple as this uh, theorem may sound and as obvious as it may sound, it's extremely hard to prove. It's not direct, so easy to prove. The reason is because uh, the curve that you can draw can be pretty complicated. So, it, you know, uh, I can, I can uh, maybe, uh, maybe by drawing a picture, I may not be able to, you know, show it, but I let me attempt. So, you see, I can draw something like this. You see, I can, I can have something, you know, uh, looking pretty complicated. You can imagine if I draw something like this, uh, in fact, this is very, very easy looking. Is it even clear that there is an interior and exterior? Now, if you look at it very carefully, uh, pieces of the curve, you can get the interior and exterior, but you imagine if the curve is pretty complicated, okay? It can be in any shape, okay? Then it's very hard to say that there is an interior of the curve and there is an exterior of the curve, that the whole plane is divided into an interior and an exterior, okay? The interior is bounded, Okay, and it is simply connected. It has no holes and the exterior is connected. Okay, all that is not easily, uh, I mean, you cannot just see it uh, optically uh, easily for uh, any complicated curve. And the whole point is that this Jordan curve theorem holds. Okay, now one of the easiest ways of proving Jordan, the Jordan curve theorem is through complex analysis by using the idea of winding number. Okay, okay. so uh, the proof of uh, such a deep theorem is connected with complex analysis. Okay. And this is a, so these are all kind of results which are very easy to believe. Uh, at least if I, if you draw a simple looking curve, you know, uh, you know, it's true. But how, for example, something that looks like a rectangle or a polygon, you know, closed polygon or a sphere, I mean, a circle or something like that. But if it's a complex, I'm just taking image of a closed interval by a continuous function. It, there's there's nothing more assumed. It could be pretty complicated, but even in that case, it's true. And uh, one of the uh, ways of proving this theorem is through complex analysis. Okay, that is one fact. So this is one thing. So this is a connection with topology. One of the connections. Here is one more. So there is there are these domains. Uh, there are these open sets, connected open sets in the plane. They are called domains. Uh, in the language of complex analysis. And these are the sets on which we study uh, complex functions, which are differentiable. Uh, see, there are domains with, without holes and they are called simply connected domains. So what is a simply connected domain? It's an open set in the complex plane. Open set means basically, you know, it's a union of disks, okay? Surrounding every point, there's a small enough disk inside that set, okay? Basically open means it should not contain any boundary. Okay, so you have open sets, take an open set in the complex plane, which is connected, okay, and connected, uh, you can uh, relax it to path connected, namely any two points can be joined by a continuous path, okay. So connectedness and path connectedness are equivalent for open sets, okay. So connected open sets are called domains. Now such a domain can have holes, okay. For example, I can take a disk and remove the center then that's not, uh, that is still connected. That's still a domain, but the problem is there's a hole there. Okay. And how do you know that there's a hole there? If I put a curve around that hole, I cannot shrink that curve to a point because I can't cross that point. If I put the condition that the curve should not go outside my domain. Okay. That point that I have punctured, that's outside my domain. So my curve, if I try to shrink it, it cannot go past that point that I've thrown out. So that point acts as a hole and it blocks the curve ar around it from shrinking to a point. Okay, so this can be made uh, more accurate uh, by studying what are called as loops and homotopy classes of loops and uh, what is called the fundamental group, which is what you do in a first course in you know algebraic topology. But the point is, it's very very simple. The lack of holes is what is called a simple connectedness. So the question is what are the simply connected subsets of the complex plane? Of course, the whole plane is simply connected. 
because there's, there are no holes. And what about simply connected subsets of the plane, which are of course open connected, which are different from the complex. So here is something very, very amazing and it's very, very hard to believe. So this is the Riemann mapping theorem, which says that any such, you know, simply connected domain in the complex plane, which is not the complex plane, which means it has at least one point, which is not, uh, it, it has, a, there's at least one point in the complex plane, which it does not have. That is topologically the unit disk. Okay. So this is very, very hard to believe. So let me write this down. This is this famous Riemann mapping theorem. So the Riemann mapping theorem is uh, any uh, simply connected uh, open connected non-empty subset of the plane, which is not the whole plane is topologically isomorphic to the unit disk. Uh, and, and what is a unit disk is just set of all z such that you know mod z less than one. So it, it has a very, very simple, so you have a very, very simple picture, namely unit, you draw the unit circle the complex plane uh, and then you know the interior is a nice disk and of course boundary should not be included because then it will not be open okay so the fact is that this is Riemann mapping theory and uh, I mean it's uh, kind of mind-boggling you all you are assuming is that there, there is an open subset in the complex plane it's connected which is the same as path connected it's not the whole plane that means there is at least one complex number which is, which is not there okay it's not the whole plane and it's simply connected that means you know it has no holes then topologically it's just a disk okay now this is very hard to believe to begin with i i in fact uh, the, the Riemann mapping theorem is much more so what you uh, so where is the complex analysis so the complex analysis here is here this topologically isomorphic means what it's homeomorphic okay that means there is a, so if you call that, you know, uh, if you call this, that subset as D, that means, you know, there exists a homeomorphism uh, H, which goes from D to, if I call this as script D for the unit disk, there's a homeomorphism like this. Homeomorphism means what? It's this H is continuous. It's one, one, it's on two, it's, that is subjective. And if you take the inverse map, H inverse, that is also continuous. That's what homeomorphism means. Topological isomorphism. Okay. So I can't even think of, you know, uh, why this should be true. Okay. But what is more, this isomorphism is not only possible at the topological level. So here is where complex analysis com comes in. This isomorphism is possible at the complex analysis level. That means you can make, you can assume, in fact, you can get H to be complex uh, differentiable. And mind you, complex differentiable means what? It means actually infinitely differentiable, complex differentiable and uh, Taylor series exists and all that. And the H inverse also will be complex differentiable. So this isomorphism, you can't, it's not that you will get it just topologically. You can actually get it in a complex analytic way. Okay, so, so the fact is that, you know, a H can be chosen to be a complex differentiable with H inverse also complex differentiable. So basically what, you, what this says is that any simply connected domain in the plane, which is not the whole plane, not only topologically looks like the disk, but also in terms of complex analysis, complex functions, it also in a complex analytic way is isomorphic to the disk. So that's a very, very, very deep statement. And this is part of uh, more generally what is called the uniformization theorem for Riemann surfaces. Okay. So this is again a very, very deep theorem. And uh, uh, the one of the uh, nice proofs involve complex analysis. Okay. So you see, 
there are these kind of topological aspects of the plane. I, I've given you two of them, the, the so-called you know, Jordan curve theorem and the Riemann mapping theorem. The proofs of these, the, these difficult theorems are accessible through complex analysis. So you see, that's another you know, uh, uh, motivation to study complex analysis. Okay? So, this is, uh, so this is about the, uh, the topological connection. Okay? And uh, so, I, so let me see uh, how much more time I, I have. I think, uh, so I wanted to say several things. Uh, let me uh, say also uh, something about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, differential geometry part of it. So I will say some connection about some connections also with differential geometry. And maybe uh, I have to stop with that, unless you give me some more time. Uh, because I would like to go on endlessly, but then I should not test the patience uh, of, of my audience. So, uh, so the 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 connections with you know differential geometry. So this so the whole idea about differential geometry as against differential calculus is that you know in differential geometry, see basically differential calculus has got to do basically with first derivative, okay? And first derivative is connected with tangents, okay? And uh, then of course, higher de derivatives will come on and so forth. But differential geometry is centered basically on the second derivative, okay? And what is the significant of, significance of the second derivative? You see, the first derivative has got to do with the tangents, okay? The second derivative has to got to do with what is called as curvature, okay? The, the you know, the amount that something curves. So the way to measure the extent to which a figure curves, whether it is a curve in plane or in space, or it is a surface in space, okay, is to measure its curvature at every point. The curvature will give you a measure of how much it is curved, okay? And that has got to do with the second derivative. Now, uh, the beautiful thing is that, uh, uh, the usual three-dimensional space that we live in, okay, or the plane that we see, there is really no curvature, everything is straight, okay? And uh, what do I mean by everything is straight? You take any two points, and if you uh, try to join them by a path of least length, you will get a straight line segment. So the, the shortest path is given by a straight line segment. But then this, if you constrain uh, the space uh, to, uh, in some way, then these shortest paths are no longer straight lines. So, for example, what happens is that you get, you can, you can, you can take a curved surface. The simplest example of a curved surface is a sphere. Okay, you take a sphere, and then you give me two points on the sphere, and then try to join them by paths on the sphere. Okay, and what will be the shortest path? It's very easy. You can think about it. The shortest path will be the shorter arc of the great circle passing through those two points. And what is a great circle passing through those two points? You take those two points on the sphere and take the center of the sphere. These will determine a plane. That plane will cut the sphere in a big circle, okay? And whose radius will be the radius of the sphere and pass through these two points. And then you take the, these two points will divide the circle into two arcs, a major and a minor arc. And then you take the minor arc and you take the length of the minor arc. That is the, that will be the smallest. And therefore, the uh, you know the uh, the uh, path of least length, which is in differential geometric terms called a geodesic, that is going to be only the minor arc of the big circle. Okay, so this leads. So what this tells you is that you know your idea of uh, shortest path, you know distance between two points, that is affected by curvature. Okay, in ordinary plane and ordinary three space, it's just straight line path. And the reason is because curvature is zero. There's no curvature at all. Whereas if you are on the sphere, there is a positive curvature, it's positively curved. And therefore, if what happens is the shortest path on the sphere is not a straight line. It becomes arc of a circle, okay? So, and, and how is this connected with complex analysis? It's connected with complex analysis because the sphere has a complex analytic interpretation. The sphere is, uh, just the one point compactification of the complex plane. It's the so-called Riemann sphere. Okay. And then what you can do is that you can take the metric on the sphere. Okay. And adapt that metric uh, 
transport it to the complex plane. Okay. And then this is then called the spherical metric. Now the advantage of this spherical metric is that it gives rise to, it can be used to define what is called a spherical derivative. And then you can use uh, functions uh, uh, studying their spherical derivatives. You can use that to prove deep theorems such as Picard theorems. Okay. So the moral of the story is that, you know, the spherical geometry, uh, geometry on the sphere is connected with complex analysis in this way. Okay. So uh, the spherical, so let me just write this spherical geometry uh, is just, you know, uh, geometry of the extended complex plane. And what is the extended complex plane? It's just C union, uh, the point at infinity. This is just the Riemann sphere. Okay, and, and the point at infinity, if you, the point at infinity is represented by the North Pole. And uh, how do you get the complex plane? Uh, the usual complex plane from the North Pole, you just project other points of the sphere or down to the plane and that's the stereographic projection, okay? So the therefore, uh, now, uh, so, so this is the, uh, so you have, you know, uh, you have the uh, case of, so spherical geometry is the case of positive curvature. The next important thing is, is there a negative curvature? Is there a space of negative curvature? So here again, something very beautiful is happening. So there is a very beautiful negative object of negative curvature right in front of our, our eyes, but we don't see it. And guess what? It is the unit disk. Okay. So the beautiful thing is that if you look at the unit disk, okay, in the unit disk, there is a spherical, I mean, there is a, uh, I mean, there is a, there is, there is, there is a curvature there that's working and it is negative curvature. And uh, so what, where did that come from? Okay. So the, uh, there is a way of detecting it using complex analysis. Okay. So in complex analysis, what we do is that we study, you know, uh, complex analytic functions, complex analytic functions are functions which are infinitely complex differentiable. And, you know, infinite differentiability, it's just enough to define one's differentiability. I told you that's the beauty of the Cauchy integral theory that you will get infinite differentiability from just one's differentiability on an open set. Okay. So, what you do is you try to, you know, study uh, holom, I mean, uh, so uh, since I just half said it, let me say it fully, holomorphic maps. So holomorphic map is, a, is another term that is used instead of analytic map or complex analytic map. Some older books also use the word conformal map. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the time to tell you about conformality, which is another absolutely beautiful property for which one should study complex analysis. So these holomorphic maps or complex analytic maps or complex differentiable maps or conformal maps as they are called. So if you, we study, suppose you have a map W equal to FZ, which goes from the unit disk back into the unit disk. Okay. Now something very, very beautiful happens. This map, either it is an isomorphism and if it is not an isomorphism, it has a contracting property. So what happens is, that it behaves in a uh, like a contraction with respect to a special metric on the unit disk, which is called the hyperbolic metric. So what happens is that this map is either, uh, you know, yeah, an isomorphism or, or a contraction. And what is, a, and it is contraction with respect to what is contraction with respect to what is called the hyperbolic metric. And where does all this come? This comes from what is called as the Schwartz, you know, pick theory. Okay. So this is a very, very essential part of complex analysis that one studies. So uh, any holomorphic, I mean, any analytic differentiable map from the unit disk to unit disk, you see, either it is an isomorphism, otherwise it has to behave like a contraction with respect to a special metric. And that's, that's how you detect this hyperbolic metric. And what is beautiful about this hyperbolic metric, it is having negative curvature. So that's the beauty. So it's very hard to imagine that the unit disk, which looks quite flat, okay, it's not curved at all, but actually it is having negative curvature. And the way to detect it is using complex analysis. Okay. And uh, for, for that matter, you may ask, what are the geodesics? 
So that's that the, the that is a very that's very easy to describe. So I will tell you what are the geodesics. So what you have to do is that you know in the unit disk, if I give you two points, what you do is you find a circle that passes through these two points, and that is orthogonal to this boundary circle. So you know. So what it means is, you know, I'll, I'll I'll have to draw a circle like this. If I draw it like this, okay, then you know, uh, at this point, if I draw the at this point, if I draw the tangent, then this is ninety degrees. So it's orthogonal. Uh, you know, two curves are orthogonal if they are tangents at that point where they intersect. They are orthogonal. So you know, and here also I put this. I this again ninety degrees, and then lo behold, this portion, you know, from here to here, that is your geodesic. So you see. It's very funny. The geodesics are not straight lines. This is uh, if you try to join it like this, that will have greater length. That's hard to believe. Why? Because it's not the usual length. This is length with respect to a different metric. And what is the formula for that metric? That all that is involved in the complex analysis. Okay, in the Schwarz pick theory. Okay, so so the moral of the story is you know you this is how you get. you know geodesics and this that you know the fact that you you with respect to uh, your ordinary uh, intuition you know this curved thing has lesser length than this straight line why is that happening that's because you are measuring this with respect to a negative curvature metric that's why something that seems to go longer is actually shorter okay that's what you have to understand that's how the negativity of the curvature is you know is is manifesting here okay so uh, you have uh, so what i want to say is the, if you look at functions on the unit disk uh, differentiable functions on unit disk taking values on the unit disk that is your candidate that is the situation uh, that's the complex analysis you have to study in order to understand negative curvature that is the basic model of negative curvature okay so that's another uh, so you see the beauty is that whether you take the complex plane which gives zero curvature or you take the riemann sphere Okay, which is the external complex plane, or you take the unit disk, which is the uh, the case of negative curvature. The Riemann sphere is a positive curvature. So all three cases of uh, you know curvature, positive, negative, and zero, they are all connected with you know studying functions on the complex plane. And uh, so you know it's uh, so that is a, that is the connection. So that is the connection with differential geometry, in to say the least. Of course, there are connections also with minimal surfaces and so on and so forth. but then this is connection with you know differential geometry so uh, in fact i was planning to say several other things but i think that uh, more or less my time is up so uh, i wanted to say something about uh, the the mysterious riemann zeta function and the riemann hypothesis and the mystery about the uh, zeta values at uh, you know odd integers i also wanted to say that in complex and and of course the reason is the zeta function is the most Uh, you know is the most amazing function in you know complex analysis the riemann hypothesis uh, as you would have all heard uh, Hil hilbert was you know he he's famed to have said that if he were to wake up after i don't know 500 or 1000 years the first question he would ask is whether the riemann hypothesis is solved and uh, using the riemann hypothesis people have proved hundred, hundreds of theorems and then separately each of these theorems they have turned out to be true so there is no any no evidence contradicting the riemann hypothesis and it is still an open problem it's one of the most important problems and it is about zeros of the riemann zeta function which is a complex analytic function okay and then uh, i also did not i would like i wanted to say something about you know uh, complex tori and their connection with to elliptic curves and which figured in the work of uh, you know uh, fermat's last theorem the proof of fermat's last theorem and uh, about these elliptic curves uh, things about some deep uh, uh, conjectures such as the birch and swinnerton dyer conjecture uh, part of which in some sense was uh, improved by bargava for which he got the fields medal okay uh, these are also you know studying elliptic curves basically uh, cor corresponds to you know studying what are called as doubly periodic complex functions and they are called elliptic functions uh, they were originally studied by jacobi okay and uh, so that is also you know so this complex analysis is connected to number theory in in, in so many ways and then uh, i think uh, the other thing i wanted to say was uh, probably uh, also uh, 
you know, uh, there are uh, practical applications of complex analysis support, which I have unfortunately not said anything. Complex analysis is used in fluid dynamics. Uh, for example, the cross section of an, uh, the wing of an aeroplane is called an aerofoil. And that function, uh, which is uh, uh, essentially some version of Z plus one by Z, okay? It's called the Zhukovsky air of, air of airfoil. And then you can use complex function theory and why complex function theory comes is there's another important story I didn't tell you. There, the complex analytic functions, they are harmonic. And harmonic functions are physically significant because these are the functions whose values at any circle, if you sum all the values and take the average, that will give you the value of the function at the center. So these are the functions with the mean value property. And mean value property is the same as harmonicity. And harmonicity is connected with complex differentiability because real and imaginary parts you know uh, of a complex differentiable function are harmonic and the converse also locally holds okay then uh, there are uh, then there is this whole uh, you know uh, theory of mobius transformations and conformal mappings about which i couldn't say so there are many other topics that i have left out but i think uh, i think i should stop here and you know um, and and uh, People can ask me if they have any questions or any suggestions. Yeah, hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Uh, yes, we are. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Sorry that we cannot offer you more time because we have another session at two. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. So if audience have any doubts, they can raise your hand. So, okay, Rajesh. Yeah. Yeah, tell me, Rajesh. Yeah. Yes, uh, it is very, very, very interesting, actually. So, how... How you came from actually, we cannot explain how uh, it's very interesting. So my doubt is, uh, uh, since you know that complex number is isomorphic to two variables, in two variables also, uh, if you take a uh, uh, continuity, uh, how to say that if the difference is continuous, then it, it also happen in the open interval. So what you can say like uh, in two variable cases and single variable cases, single variable of complex complex analysis because if one derivative happens, the other derivative also continues. So how we connect to the we can connect to two variable cases? So so you are you are talking about two real variables, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So two real variables, uh, the story is not uh, you know uh, uh, it's not so good. So so I'll tell you what happens in two variables. In fact, even in two variables, real variables, it's more complicated than what happens in one variable. See, in two real variables, the following thing happens. You can have a function. So uh, you can have a function at a, uh, which is at a point, of course, you know, you start with at least continuous function. Okay. Then what you can do is you can get the partial derivatives with respect to X and Y, right? Yes. So yes. you can write, you can write partial derivative with respect to X and partial derivative with respect to Y. Now you see the, if, so what you can have is you can have a function which is for which, you know, partial derivative with respect to X and partial derivative with respect to Y exists. Okay. And, you know, the sad thing is that it may not even be continuous. Okay. The, so the, so you can, so what is partial derivative with respect to X and partial derivative with respect to Y? It means that, you know, they are directional derivatives. Partial derivative with respect to X is di derivative in the X direction. Tangent, tangent. And uh, yeah, and pa partial derivative with respect to y is derivative in the y direction, right? But then why change? Why keep only two directions? What you can do is you can try to take any direction and try to define what is called as directional derivative. Okay, so you can have situation where you have function, okay, that it has directional derivatives in all directions, not just x and y directions, but in every direction you can have directional derivatives, and the problem is. In spite of that, the function may even fail to be continuous at that particular point. Okay, this is the horrible thing that can happen. 
Okay. So that we needed the open interval around that to make it continuity continuity of derivative. Uh, so two so, uh, so so J wait 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 wait. Uh, no no no. I I think uh, uh, part of what you said didn't come uh, come out. Now you can you can you repeat what what are you saying? Yeah, because for a uh, derivative of double variables to be continuity, we need a uh, continuity of a partial derivative and also you know neighborhood of this point. To make it a continuity of these uh, uh, double two variables, so uh, like that, if you go to the same idea, we can extend it. Is it okay? No, it will not work. So okay, so yeah, I I understand you are asking why it's not happening for two real variables, but it's happening for one complex variable, but they are the same. That's what you are asking, right? Yeah, yeah, because there it is also neighborhood happens in two. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, okay, okay. So there, yeah, it's a very beautiful question. See, the missing link is given by another magical thing. This magical thing is called the Cauchy-Riemann equation. Okay, so when you write a complex function of complex variable, you you write it as f equal to f of z. Its real part is written as u of z, and imaginary part is written as v of z. So you write f of z as u of z plus i times v of z. So u of z is the real part, v of z is the imaginary part. Now what happens is that this u and v. They satisfy two simultaneous partial first-order partial differential equations, which are called the Cauchy-Riemann equations. U x equal to v y and v x yes. equal to minus u y. Okay, yes. if that comes, okay, that is the missing link. If that is there, then this will not happen. So uh, it is a very very deep theorem. It's a very very deep theorem. You take a complex function, okay. Assume it is at. Don't even assume it's continuous. So you see, this is very, 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 very deep theorem. Take a complex function. Don't even assume it's continuous, but assume that at every point it is locally bounded. That means in a, at every point there is a small disk where the function values are bounded. I don't even assume continuity. Suppose that function has only first partial derivatives, and the first partial derivatives sat satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations in the in that in that domain. Then that function is infinite is is actually analytic. Okay, so the magic is Cauchy-Riemann equations. Yes, Cauchy but there is only, there is only continuity. Yes. Uh, uh, no Cauchy, uh, but mind you, I am not even assuming. I am only assuming first partial derivatives exist. I am not assuming first partial derivatives are continuous. Please understand. You have to understand. If you assume first partial derivatives exist and are continuous, that is called C one. C one is one step more than differentiability. Okay, so there are, for example, differentiable functions, real differentiable functions of two real variables, which for which the first partials are not continuous. Okay, so continuity of first partial derivatives is more than one's differentiability. It is it is what is called as C one. It's more than D one, which is just first differential. But here, what I am saying is, you just assume f equal to u plus i v. Assume u u and v satisfy Cauchy-Riemann equations. That is, u u x exists, u y exists, v x exists, v y exists, and then u x equal to v y, v x equal to minus u y. You assume, but don't assume u and v are you are the u x and v x are continuous. Continuous. Yes. See, okay. Don't assume their continuity. Just assume Cauchy-Riemann equations exist and assume f is. But just assume one simple thing. Don't even f assume f is continuous. Assume that. At every point, there is a small disk where f is bounded. That is locally bounded. Okay, then amazing thing. That is the power of Cauchy-Riemann equations. This f is continuous. It is differentiable. It's infinitely differentiable. Everything good happens to it. So the magic that you are searching for, that actually distinguishes the real and the complex case, is the Cauchy-Riemann equations. These Cauchy-Riemann equations are extremely magical. In fact, there is a theorem of Hartog from about almost 120 120 years ago that if instead of taking one complex variable, if you take n complex variables, and separately in each variable, if the Cauchy-Riemann equations hold, okay, then the function is actually in all the variables are uh, complex differentiable. Okay, and by the way, you know this is not true. Again, the real case: you you can have a function of two real variables separately in each variable. The function may be differentiable, but put together, it may not even be continuous. Okay, 
so it's a so this what happens in complex analysis of one variable is something amazing if you go more than one variable uh, complex analysis is, uh, of more than one variable that's even more amazing you have something uh, amazing such as uh, hartog's theorem but what is the what is it that creates all this magic it's these partial differential equations the cauchy riemann equations that creates that is so powerful okay so if so if uh, whatever you are doing with your real case suppose you are able to also have the cauchy riemann equations then nothing will go wrong that's what you have to understand so the magic is with the cauchy riemann equations yes sir is yes. now i am got it thank you very much sir it's welcome. really very interesting and we are enjoyed this lecture sir because your approach is starting from the beginning to number system to how you enter to complex analysis from all the directions all the subjects enter here so this only will interest us to learn subject more and more uh, very nice very nice in fact so uh, so you know you, there are the in fact the, the the theory is much more deeper that that actually you should go and learn riemann surfaces okay and i have uh, you can look at my nptel videos where i have made a humble attempt to explain some of these things of course lot of other people have also given lot of material and videos and books are now available but according to me if you really want to learn one area of mathematics where you see every other area coming in okay then it complex analysis in complex analysis topology algebraic topology number theory algebraic geometry complex analysis differential equations everything will come in and uh, all and everything will come in and then you get, get something very beautiful so you see the connection of so many areas of mathematics so that is a great motivation to learn complex analysis so how you are entering the linear algebra here pardon me linear algebra algebra linear algebra oh, you are saying uh, how how linear algebra comes here yeah so in many yeah. ways so for example i can tell you linear algebra see first thing in linear algebra is you take any matrix okay if you want to get eigen values what will you do you will you will try to get uh, the zeros of the characteristic polynomial but yes. characteristic polynomial if it is over real numbers zeros can be complex so you see that means the moral of the story is even if you give me a real matrix treat it as first as complex matrix yes yes and study the complex linear map and then get the uh, you know the information for the real linear map so the, that is the moral of the story so more generally you know if you want to do linear uh, linear algebra over a field the correct way is you go to the algebraic closure of the field and do linear algebra there and then come down by using the galois group that is the correct way to do it okay so that is one of the that is one of the things the other way in which linear algebra comes is these matrix groups are actually mobius transformations so the yes. automorphisms of the whole riemann sphere they are exactly the 2 by 2 invertible matrices complex matrices up to you know uh, up to scalars this is called the mobius group and similarly you have got subgroups which correspond to the upper half plane which correspond to the unit disk so these are all subgroups of lie groups and the beauty with the subgroups of these lie groups is they control all the classification of all the riemann surfaces okay the riemann surfaces are studied by reduction used to you know Uh, the uh, the studying of subgroups of mobius transformations using the uniformization theorem and using the theory of the fundamental group and covering spaces so uh, linear algebra is very much there it's 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 kind of buried there you you, you can you can see that so it's almost time so we are yeah, yeah, now yeah yeah so so let's thank our speaker balaji sir so it was a wonderful talk so in Uh, i thank you for accepting our invitation and joining with us so next i also thank uh, mtts trust for their support and one more thing i have to add if you want to learn this complex analysis even if you have learned the first course in complex analysis professor kumareshan sir has uploaded uh, a series of videos in in his youtube channel and currently he is i think he has uploaded 31 lectures so i request all of you to visit his channel and uh, watch his videos it's really helpful and i have already watched some videos and it is well structured so you can always do that and also for advanced complex analysis you can watch balaji sir's npetel lectures and uh, that's it and our next session will start at 2 and we have a talk by dr rakhi banerji on teaching and learning of mathematics insight from algebra then from 3 to 5 we have a talk on uh, creating presentation 
use in LaTeX by Mr. Kiran, PhD student, IIT Dharwad. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thanks uh, to Professor Kumarasan again, you know, for this extraordinary service given done by MTTS. Uh, so, and, and also for your nice club, I, I wish that you, uh, you know, uh, enthuse a lot of students to again attract them back to uh, do a lot of nice mathematics and enjoy mathematics. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Sir. <clears throat> so the next session will start at two the zoom link is the same so you can join through the same zoom link thank you